Okay, July 20th, 1991. Traveling in a place like Sedona or Red Rock, but not any of these places different. So now coming back to the stream and reading it linked with potentially the Laurelhurst Park gates, because those are made of sandstone. There's a potential link there. Okay, it's not any of these places, but different. We went one day for a short time. Now we've gone back to spend two days and a night. It's like you go there and watch some sort of battle reenactment, yet it's a real battle. Image of a lake. There's a lake there. Maybe fireworks. Now I can't remember anything else about what we were watching except the battle, and then we camp. Then the next day it seems we go around and see many people. There's an image of someone crossing a lake. Right there. It's a beautiful place. We're about to go home. When I see this line drawing artwork, beautiful. Suddenly Michelle DiCostanzo is off to the side talking about it. I say, oh, this is one of my favorite artists. I can't remember his name. He was both an, He has both an Indian name and an English name. There are many Indian people in my dream, as in Native American. There's one now ignoring me. He paints these paintings where one minute it's a saguaro cactus, and the next you see a man with a pipe in his mouth. And that is what this and another drawing are, a man with a pipe or a saguaro cactus, depending on how you look. Michelle says, a very good artist, pointing to the lines. I seem to remember other paintings, more solid, more paint, but still I recognize the style. It's unmistakable. Oh, I say, I remember his name. It's Peter Blue Cloud, or Anya, and I think it might be the name of an African drummer. Uh, in real life, Peter Blue Cloud is a poet in this book I have. Um, so now I see that this has to do with these clouds, and that it's linked with Michelle partly because of the um, song Raspberry Beret, and so it's line drawings. I'm delighted with the beautiful, earthy, earthly, earthy paintings. In one, it seems like the saguaro is upside down. We need to leave. Ben needs to get back to work. There is a band playing on a little stage. They are saying how they make music. First the vowel sounds, and they demonstrate, and then the consonants. There are two men and a woman. One guy beating on a huge box that says war corn. Looks like army issue food or something. Image of Lynn Lester, Joan, Joni. Jane Fonda. So Lynn Lester is a friend of my mom's. Comes up in my dreams too much to be a coincidence. She has to have something to do with this. And she actually just came up in my dream yesterday. Or a vision, actually. And at this time, I think she was working for the FBI in San Francisco. Joni is my mom's sister. Joni went to school, to college at Berkeley. And has been ill her entire life, I think, because of all the exact same kind of um, technology that's been used to make me and so many other people ill. Um, in Joni's case, it was um, diagnosed, she was diagnosed as having um, manic depressive disorder, psychotic episodes and things like that, was given a lot of lithium to take, which ended up destroying her kidneys, and she ended up having to get a kidney transplant from her daughter. Um... I believe this was all manufactured. Jane Fonda, um, not sure why she showed up here. <laughs> it is actually Julie and Gary Brusca together on horses. Here, a photograph or slide taken by an Indian or Native American person. They are in a beautiful place. Like the rock quarry. They are on horses, touching um, lovingly. 
Next, a photo of Julie alone on her horse, an image of her face floating in the air outside of her, talking to her, giving her advice. Another image, beautiful. These pictures have been taken by a Native American person. We must go, but we keep wanting to stay longer. The battle or event people go. I asked Ben if anyone could work for Ben tomorrow night. I don't think so. It's late and we're tired and sleepy. We talk about staying until the next war, but Ben has to get back to work. And besides, we may not survive another one. So we are, you know, this rock quarry then um, becomes maybe more about, um, more than just about, or even at all about the rock quarry behind our home. Although I think the rock quarry behind our home is important because it's part of how I linked our home to the movie Red House, which came out in 1947. Um, it might have to do with the rock quarry linked with the, um, Laurelhurst Park and those gates because that would have been more like a place like Red Rock and Red Rock indeed I see had a quarry there that sold that type of sandstone um, in the early 1900s um, and there's matches to other things in here too um, I've already noticed matches to the movie um, or the Mickey Mouse animation called um, Opry House. But um, War Corn is matched to a book. Um, and it has to do with setting up the people who I would meet later on, who ended up being, you know, my daughter's father's family, to fight against my family. So that's a setup. The thing that reason why I came back to this now has to do with this um, Gary Bresca image, the photograph or slide taken by a native person. Now this is interesting too because I'm I'm not not sure if I mentioned this, but I'm going to mention it. The last photos I had of Gary were somehow taken by a member of my daughter's father's family. What happened was they spent the night at my house. And someone from that family, I was told it was a child, I'm not sure if it was a child, but I was told it was a child, took the camera, took my camera, um, with the film in it. And so I wrote to the family, and the mother said, oh, my daughter took this camera, and then she re returned the camera to me, but the thing is, the film was missing from the camera when it was returned to me. So these were photographs of my last um, Christmas spent with the Bruscas and Eureka before they moved to Sacramento and Gary became, um, you know, was diagnosed shortly, shortly after moving to Sacramento, fairly shortly, maybe within a year or two. So um, I just wanted to make sure that that, you know, to make it clear that this matches um, this idea of um, <sighs> But the thing is, that dream has um, for the Bruscas on horses. Now this is where it's going to get really interesting and disturbing for me. Um, because Lynn Lester, who worked for the San Francisco F office of the FBI, was a horse friend of my mom's. Now, I'm given to understand since this time that this was a very corrupt FBI office. That's what I've heard. The way I've heard that, the reason I've heard that, is because of what happened to Judy Berry. And Judy Berry was in Oakland, California. Her car blew up. And the FBI in that jurisdiction, you know, um, first of all, blamed Judy Berry and said that she herself was transporting the bomb that exploded the car. And um, that 
they pointed out pretty quickly that that obviously couldn't be true because the bomb was activated by motion. So why would she be transporting a bomb underneath the seat of her car that's activated by motion? Um, and there were all kinds of other problems with that investigation. Um, then, a couple years later, Judy Berry, who's, I think, in her 40s, suddenly gets terminal breast cancer and dies. So, um, <clears throat> a lot of um, smoking guns right there with that particular office of the FBI. And I don't know for certain that was the office Lynn Lester was working for. But there's a good chance. Um... And I don't even know for certain that this was the period of time that Lynn was working for the FBI, but I do think it is. Um, and then again, Lynn's, um, when those two mountain lion attacks happened on livestock, um, Lynn Lester's sheep was one of the animals that was taken, you know, by these mountain lions that I've later determined to have been under mind control as well. So um, that suggests to me that maybe they were trying to send a message to this person. The, the, it's just unbelievable, some of this stuff. Um, and my mom is not looking really good in all of this either. <clears throat> um, but I want to show what happened when I first discovered this, okay? When it first dawned on me that this is what had happened to Gary... I just, it was, um, I think it was last year, I went outside and took a walk, and that was the first time I really noticed that something definitely had been done to the clouds on purpose. So that's a link to this blue cloud. Kind of interesting that I chose this desktop for my computer um, way before I started figuring out any of the stuff about clouds and stuff. And um, I've had this up for quite a while. These are the photos that I took on that day. Um, the clouds were interesting looking. This one is actually, and now I'm just noticing something I hadn't seen before, which is this blue, it looks like almost a blue hole above where my apartment building would be. Then, so what happened was a lot of people had let their cats out this day. They were like, the Bruscas loved cats. They were always, they always had cats. Um, and there were a lot of cats around the neighborhood as I was walking and um, planes flying around. And um, some planes flew around enough to get my attention. This is actually the same shot with just different lighting. So that's with the lighting focused on the sky. And this is with the lighting focused on the ground. Same house. So for some reason, my attention was peaked right about this point And I turned around. I was <clears throat> triggered to turn around. And I saw this truck here, which looks a lot like Gary's old truck. And then I turned back around the other direction and looked up into the sky, and this is what I saw. I saw these um, two claws that look like stomatopod claws. So Gary um, and my dad did this magazine together called the stomatopod. So there's a cloud here, and there's a cloud there. I'll show you why I think that looks like a stomatopod. I mean, it's like lobster claws or a stomatopod. I've actually got my old copies of Stomatopod um, locked away, but, I mean, uh, not in a convenient spot right now, but here's here's this, movie, this video that I made about Stephen Hillenberg, who must have had Gary as a marine biology professor at Humboldt State. Um, and so the cover of this magazine would always have this little Stomatopod character, so there's the, his head, and you can see he's got these little um, sort of little lobster claws coming out. That's what they look like. So Gary was a marine biologist, so those are giant, in my opinion. And I think I'm correct. They're intended to look like giant stomatopod claws in the clouds. So I took a few pictures of these because it was pretty astounding looking. And they were flying planes all around this to make sure that I saw this as well. So I took this, you know, that was a big revelation to me. Um, you know, I think it would be to anybody to see, to find out that this was, um, this lung cancer was a murder, you know, an assassination. And so then I walk outside and I saw this. I saw, you know, Gary's truck and some 
you know, aircraft and these giant claws in the sky. So I think it was basically, you know, talking about, you know, look out.